Bad Brains by Kathy Koja is one of the best books I've ever read. I didn't really read all that much horror. I just found it to be too pulpy. Uh, I haven't read that much. I've read like one Stephen King book. I read Salem's Lot. It was okay. I've read probably a couple others. I read Goosebumps when I was a kid, of course. I look at it as an outsider and I just don't see quite as much meat on the bone in terms of like meaningful subject matter and meaningful content in the way that I do with, with science fiction. Bad Brains changed that impression in me, or at least it gave me um, a window into a reality in which that doesn't necessarily have to be the case. And I think that this book, Bad Brains, reached a high in its horror elements uh, because of its horror elements that would not have been available to it in a science fiction story. Bad Brains is about a guy that works a menial job at a t-shirt printing shop and has been broken up with by a long-term girlfriend that he's still in love with and is kind of depressed and miserable and is also an artist who has fallen into a fallow period in his art and he does these grotesque paintings of Egyptian gods and goddesses and people would commission him to do these works of just straight portraiture and he would present them with these horror show paintings of them as these, these monsters. The protagonist is named Austin. Uh, he has one friend who owns a, an art gallery who's constantly trying to encourage him to get back into the art and to, to showcase some of his work at the gallery and he's always resistant to it and finally the friend convinces him to come with him to a house party, twist his arm into doing it and he stops at a 7-Eleven I think uh, to pick up some beer for the party, gets into a scuffle with the cashier and as he is exiting the shop is is aping at the cashier and doing this little dance to mock her and trips over a curb falls and hits his head on the asphalt and wakes up in the hospital having given himself some kind of a, a fracture or brain hemorrhage that induces chain strokes in him um, or epileptic not strokes seizures rather he has these intense intense seizures that are excruciatingly painful and one of the byproducts or one of the symptoms of the uh, seizures is he starts seeing this ethereal silvery liquid thing in shadows and in the peripheries of his vision and uh, the horror kind of expands from there. It's the first time I've ever been really moved by any piece of horror literature and probably any piece of horror period I would say. Even the horror movies that I really love like Alien, I don't know that I was, have ever been really moved by Alien uh, as much as I love and admire and cherish that film. I can't think of another instance where I, my, my heart was really wrapped up in it. And that sounds, uh, again, kind of precious, but um, deeply, 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 deeply moved by that story and the, the depiction of Austin's struggle and his pain. And um, just right from the start, after this, the, the ennui of the initial period of the, the stage setting of the plot, when he's in the hospital and he's struggling with his situation and just lost in this abyss of, of sadness and despair and fear at his, his condition and the descriptions of, of his pain and his loneliness and his, his longing for uh, his ex-girlfriend and any, any kind of solidarity and love is just heartbreaking. That clench never really releases for the entire story. It follows Austin after he's released from the hospital, trying to adjust to his new normal. The prose is spectacularly good in a unique way that, again, I don't think that I can really describe. It's just absolutely masterful. It's just, with a capital M, it's absolutely flawless. It's also written with a high degree of realism. It takes place in all these consumerist wastelands, these uh, almost post-apocalyptic parking lots and dive bars and convenience stores and cheap motels. Uh, and there's this building atmosphere of, of panic that uh, just ramps up until the end. And um, it goes to some dark places and some, some violent places, but it never was over the top. I gave Bad Brains a 10 out of 10. I don't remember when the last 10 out of 10 I gave to a book was. The second book is God's Demon by Wayne Barlow. By the way, I have individual review videos for all these books, and in fact, every book that I read on my Patreon, uh, it's five bucks, it gets you access to everything. I think the Bad Brains video is like 17 minutes long. I talk about it really in depth. 
uh, and, and this one as well. There's a link to that in the description. I don't think I've talked about Barlow on this channel for a while. I talked about him a lot during my Whatnot auctions. He's my favorite genre artist. In my estimation, he's the best ever. This is his debut novel. It came out in 2007. As far as I know, it's his only work of fiction to that point that he had put out, other than Expedition, which had text in it, but it was really more of an art book than a, a novel. It's a really unique depiction of hell and the demons that populate hell that's based on different pieces of mythology. Hey, I'm sorry this is gonna mess with the continuity, but I have to change spots. I can't deal with the buses. Sorry about that. That was on a rooftop and there's a steep street right close by. The buses constantly go up and I didn't anticipate it being that loud. God's Demon is the story of a fallen angel named Sargatanus who lives in a, a city in hell, one of many cities that are lorded over by different demons major, the Sephirim, Seraphim after the fall, who, when they fell, landed in disparate, far-flung parts of hell, which is kind of a wilderness that already has things living in it. There are abyssal creatures, big animals, and there's a race of what are called salamandrine men, who are basically the Fremen from Dune, who are uh, the indigenous uh, bipedal humanoid life form who live in hell and, and know how to survive in hell outside of the cities. And the cities are constantly at war with each other over turf and power. Uh, Lucifer has disappeared. Nobody knows where he is or why he disappeared. And he has left Beelzebub in his wake to govern as the prince regent and uh, Beelzebub and Sargatanus come to loggerheads. When I found this book, I was nervous to read it because I worried that it would be mediocre. Um, the writing itself is kind of a little bit mediocre, unfortunately, but the world building is so rich and so good that I think it makes up for it. I'll talk about the negatives first. The characterization is, is pretty stock. It's almost like pro wrestling characters. There are heels and faces, and there's, there's a little bit of moral ambiguity in certain spots that's interesting, but for the most part, it's good guys versus bad guys. And none of the individual characters are really that distinct. They kind of are these archetypes of the hero and the lover and the villain, etc. The dialogue also I found a little wooden. The plot also lags in the second half. With all that out of the way, the world building is superb. It's my favorite rendition of Hell that I've ever seen or read anywhere. It's really interesting. It feels more like a science fiction world than like a fantasy world or like something out of the Bible or something out of Milton, having not read Milton. Um, it does feel quite a bit like James Blish in uh, Black Easter and Day After Judgment. And that is not a coincidence, I don't think. Barlow painted the cover art that was used for both of those books. And he wrote God's Demon with a lot of uh, that same Blishian eye for historical accuracy. Took a lot of the names and a lot of the pieces of the lore from pieces of occult writing. The creatures in it are great, the demons are great, the physical descriptions of the world and the lamentations and sufferings of the, the people who are banished there are pretty hair-raising in parts. There, there's a lot of gruesome stuff in the book. I, I definitely would qualify it as horror. I, maybe the second the second tier fantasy first and then horror i would say if you like fantasy or you like the subject matter i would give god's demon a shot i gave it a seven out of ten i will also say if you're a big dune fan i think god's demon has a lot in common and then the chrysalids by john Wyndham. the chrysalids is his most famous his most celebrated well not his most famous his most famous is day of the trip is but chrysalids is held forth is kind of his crowning literary achievement. I don't know that I really agree just based on the works that I have read. Uh, I would put this about on par with Creek and Wakes. And I think Midwitch Cuckoos is the superior novel, uh, which was published right after this one. And these are, I think, in concert with one another. Chrysalis takes place in a Canada in a relatively far future post-apocalyptic world where a big chunk of the uh, terrain has been turned into wasteland uh, after a big nuclear war. And the novel follows a kid named David who lives in this religious fundamentalist community who are kind of um, like Amish, almost agrarian, relatively low technology, drive around in wagons, horse-drawn wagons. And because of the nuclear fallout, there are all kinds of genetic mutations that happen both 
in people and in uh, the, the crops that they grow and in the flora and fauna in the wilderness. The religious interpretation of the mutations is to see them as ungodly and worthy of destruction or exile. And David grows up in this, this claustrophobically orthodox situation and comes to find that he has a remarkable ability, and I won't say more. I just felt that it was a little bit too close to YA for my taste. My other gut level response that turned me off just a little bit is I am at this point tired of this same old routine with the thematics of how religion is treated in science fiction books. This antagonism towards religion, we're portraying it as uh, the terrain of murderers and psychopaths. This version of it that's just the most hard-edged, extreme kind of fanaticism. I just, I, I find it boring. Of course, like, these people are real, these people exist, and these are based on real events. I just have read it and seen it and heard it so many times. At this point, I simply am bored of reading that story of the uh, bold, brave individual struggling to overcome the small-mindedness of their religious peers. It is good, and it is more streamlined and readable than the other Wyndham books that I've read. And Wyndham is a good writer and he's never a dumb writer. Very even-handed, very smooth, especially in this one. This is a quicker read, even though it's the same length as the other two Wyndhams that I mentioned. This one reads more quickly. It's more action-y and it doesn't dwell. Cuckoo's dwells. And I, that's one of the reasons why I do like that book a little bit more because it takes bigger risks. It asks bigger questions and it kind of sits in them for longer. This one, accelerates all the way to this ending that I didn't, I, I found pretty lame. Um, but along the way, we laugh, we cry, not really, but it, you know, it's, it's a good yarn. I gave it a seven out of 10. I gave Cuckoo's a seven out of 10 as well, but the, that's a, it's a, a lighter shade of seven. But if you like the genocides, if you like the Handmaid's Tale, you will probably like the chrysalids. Thanks for watching and thanks for sitting with me through all the weird ambient noise. Appreciate it.